Perennial Wisdom for Daily Life by D.Q. McInerney. Technology, February 2010. Who amongst us is so dull of heart, so jaded in his response to material reality, not to stand in positive awe of, or at least show some rudimentary respect and appreciation for, what are often flamboyantly described, though not entirely without justification, the wonders of modern technology. One has only to consider how, over the past 150 years or so, human life on this earth has been completely transformed by technology in fields such as, for example, manufacturing, transportation, medicine, and communication. In the field of manufacturing, technology has become so advanced that in terms of what philosophers would call the proximate cause, many of our machines are now made by machines, and so little does the human hand have often directly to do with the finished product that one might wonder if we don't need a new word in order more precisely to describe what is actually taking place. Machinafacturing as a substitute for manufacturing. It took the Mayflower over two rocky and dangerous months to make the crossing from Plymouth, England, to what is now Massachusetts. Today, a body can fly, fly, mind you, from, say, Chicago to just about any other place on the globe and in a matter of hours. People who are effectively given up as dead in the not too distant past on account of some ailment or another are now restored to perfect health by a variety of med medical treatments or surgical procedures. And many once lethal diseases have been effectively eliminated by miracle vaccines. The transformation that technology has brought about in the communications field can easily boggle any mind which might pause to reflect on it. Either for our, our edification or for our disgust, we can now know in a matter of seconds what people are doing on the other side of the globe. And if we so desire, we can make personal contact with people on the other side of the globe, also in a matter of seconds, simply by tapping out an email, type, tapping out an email message or picking a cell phone out of pocket or purse. And should vanity or egotism dictate, we can even in a trice send a picture of ourselves to far distant places, instant self-advertisement, and think of the radical changes our domestic lives have borne witness to since the days of our great grandparents. What with the advent of marvels such as indoor plumbing, central heating and air conditioning and electricity, the last ushering in a whole array of labor saving devices, some of the most ingenious kind, conveniences we call them. All in all, modern technology, when you stop to think about it, has brought about a rather amazing state of affairs. We live in a world which has been changed profoundly and seemingly unalterably by technology. What are we to make of it? Do we live in a new Eden? Because a phenomenon which we might call the technolo technologiz technologization, technologization <laughs> of society is now pretty much total, at least in our society here in the United States, because our lives are so tightly hemmed in on every side of technology, by technology, indeed in great part defined by technology, we do not for the very reason given it much thought. We do not for that very reason give it much thought any more than we give thought to the fact that we are immersed in a sea of air. As with air, so with technology. We don't think about it, we just breathe it in. We take the wonders of modern technology for granted even to the point where they lose, for better or worse, their wonderfulness. Although technology as the man-made, the artificial, is the very antithesis of the natural, so common and integral a part of our lives has it become that we actually tend to believe that technology is simply the given, representing things, not only the way they are, but in every important respect, the way they should be. We see the man-made, the artificial, as the natural. What this comes down to in the end is the fact that we have lost our perspective and as a result are failing to make some critically important distinctions and then working out the practical implications of those distinctions. We are no longer looking at reality straight on, seeing the world as it actually is. If we were to do so, we would recognize our proper place in that world and how we would be relating to it in terms of the most basic of our moral responsibilities. What is the most important distinction we need to acknowledge vis-a-vis -vis technology? We must come to see on the most fundamental level 
how it differs from nature. Nature is the given that with which we are presented, so to speak, when we arrive on the scene. Nature is the God-made. Technology, by way of contrast, is the man-made, the artificial. Do not necessarily think of the artificial in pejorative terms, as if it referred only to the fake, the not genuine. The basic meaning of artificial is found in its reference to something which is man-made. It is what human beings do to transform the given or the natural. Artificial has its roots in the Latin arte and factum, made by art, thus an artefact is a work of art. Once we have succeeded in clearly distinguishing the artificial, i.e. technology, from the natural, the next thing we, might, we must make explicit to ourselves is how to relate to one another. They are not at all on the same plane. The natural is foundational. The artificial is derivative. The artificial depends on the natural first because it owes its intelligibility to the natural. Second, and on a deeper level, because it simply could not exist without the natural. For after all, the artificial is nothing else but the manipulation, the reworking of the natural, that which is given to us. When we see how technology relates to nature as entirely dependent upon it, as a secondary reality depends on the primary reality, then we are properly disposed to give deserving primacy of place to nature. But how often does that happen? Not as often as it should, I'm afraid. The problem we face today is this, because of the virtually total technolo technologiz technologization of the world in which we live, there is the resulting propensity on our part to regard technology as if it were natural, thus falsifying it. And with the result that we lose touch with the truly natural, so steeped have our lives become in the secondary reality, which is technology, that we are growing less and less conscious of the primary reality, which is nature. It is as if modern technology, for all its admitted wonders, has built a barrier, a huge silicon wall, between ourselves and the natural world. We are so enamored of, so fascinated and seduced by the man-made that we become increasingly insensitive to the God-made.